Hi guys, I'm Dr. Tan here. I'm glad to see you guys back to the lecture today, in which we are going to discuss about one of the most important topics in clinical medicine, that is about acute ischemic stroke. There are many reasons why I said so, but I would just like to highlight to you the two most important reasons and or the mo two most important facts that you should know of before we start off the lectures. I think the first point is that acute ischemic stroke is actually one of the major cause of uh, morbidities and also mortalities amongst our Malaysians. And second of all, acute ischemic stroke are largely managed by non-neurologists, for example, like a general physician myself, and also it could be managed by uh, medical officers like yourself that would be serving in a district hospital with or without a specialist. This is the overview of the lecture today. In the usual manner, I will start off by giving you an overview about our Malaysian stroke epidemiology. Following that, we are going to discuss about the stroke definitions and most importantly, I will give you a brief lecture about basic neuroanatomy which will form as a foundation for you to understand the stroke classification systems later on. And uh, I will also discuss with you in depth about the stroke management strategies and I will end the lectures by giving you a few case illustrations to uh, highlight to you that why certain stroke phenotypes require you know, special considerations. This slide just to give you a graphical illustration about the points that I have mentioned to you earlier on. Basically, you can see from this slide, stroke was actually one of the most important cause of mortalities amongst our Malaysians. In fact, it was ranked as the third commonest cause of mortalities in year 2018 as well as in year 2019. Therefore, it's important for uh, all of us to have a uh, sound knowledge about this debilitating illness. This is the stroke definitions proposed by our Malaysian Stroke CPG and there is a few key points in these definitions and I would highlight each of them to you. But the first point is that stroke is actually a clinical syndrome that is developing rapidly. Therefore, when you are seeing a subject that is of suspected stroke, the first task is to determine whether the clinical symptoms are of abrupt onset or not first. The second point to highlight is that the clinical signs of stroke will largely depend on the area of infarcts. If the area of infarcts were to be confined to a focal area of the brain, and the clinical signs will be of focal neurological deficit, for example, like uh, hemiparesis or hemisensory loss. On the other hand, if the aerial infarcts were to be of large volume, then the patient would manifest with a global neurological deficit with loss of cerebral functions. So what it means is that the patient might have impact conscious level and they may lose the higher cortical functions, for example, like speech. And the third and also the most important point to highlight is that the stroke symptoms must last more than 24 hours. If the symptoms were to be last less than 24 hours, then there could be a manifestation of transient ischemic attack, which I'm going to talk about later on. The last two points to highlight to you is that if the stroke were to be severe enough, it may lead to death. A common example would be a large volume infarct like acute MCA infarcts or acute brainstem infarcts which have very guided prognosis. And the last point is that the stroke should be of vascular origins. As I have stated earlier, if the clinical signs of acute stroke were to be last less than 24 hours, then you need to consider that the patients might be having a transient ischemic attack rather than an acute stroke instead. So it's important to differentiate these two because in a subject that present with an episode of TIA or transient ischemic attack, it signals that that subject is actually at a very high risk of developing a full-blown stroke. Therefore, we must actually take the necessary actions to prevent a subject with TIA from developing a full-blown stroke. Before we discuss about the stroke classifications, I would like to emphasize that you need to have a basic neuroanatomy knowledge so that you can understand the subsequent part of the lecture better. Therefore, I have handpicked a few images that you should keep in your mind and use it as a reference during the discussion. Basically, in a human brain, it can be divided into a few important structures. So the first thing to remember is that there are four important loops in the human brain, which is your frontal loop, parietal loop, occipital loop, and the temporal loop. Besides this, there are two other important structures that can be found in the human brain, which is your cerebellum and the brain stem. 
There are many specialized areas in the brain that have a different specialized functions. For the sake of these lectures, I would just like to highlight to you four important areas that will enable you to understand the lecture better later on. So the first area will be your precentral gyrus, which is your primary motor cortex. So any involvement in this it will manifest as a motor dysfunctions. So behind this uh, central gyrus is your post-central gyrus, which is your primary somatosensory cortex. So any involvement in this cortex, it would manifest as a somatosensory dysfunctions. And lastly, which is uh, we're going to talk about the Broca area or the Wernicke area, which is your speech centers that is situated in the temporal lobe. So if uh, any of these uh, areas is involved, it may manifest as a you know, either as a dysphasia, aphasia, and so on. The cerebral blood supply can be divided into two systems, which is the anterior circulations and the posterior circulations. And for these anterior circulations, it actually consists of the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. So for the SCA, it supplies the frontal lobe as well as the medial part of the cerebrum. On the other hand, the MCA artery it supplies the lateral part of each hemisphere. The posterior circulation consists of this posterior cerebral artery which supplies the occipital lobe and also the vertebral basal circulation which supplies the cerebellum, brainstem as well as the occipital lobes. We are using this Oxfordshire stroke classification system to classify the stroke that our patient is having. Therefore, I think it's clear to you now when we are doing round, we always you know, label our patients having Lachi, Tachi or Pochi. And each of these labels is actually directly referred to the area of the circulations that has been affected. First and foremost, let's take a look at the commonest form of stroke which is Lacuna infarct or also known as a Lachi. This is actually a form of sarcoptical infarct which is different from the rest of the stroke phenotypes like Pachi, Tachi, Pochi because the rest of it are actually a cortical infarct. Therefore, the clinical manifestations are actually very different. Another point to highlight to you is that lacuna infarct arises from an occlusions of a single deep perforating artery. As opposed to the rest of the stroke phenotypes, they arise because there is an occlusion to a large cerebral artery instead of a single deep perforating artery. The left-hand CT image illustrates to you the common sites of lacuna infarct, which is surrounding the basal ganglia area where your deep perforating arteries are located. So when that happens, the patient will present to you with uh, either hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, or combinations of sensory motor loss, and rarely they might present with ataxic hemiparesis as well. The most important point to highlight here is that patients with lacuna infarct they shouldn't have cortical signs. If they have cortical signs, then most likely they have a cortical infarct like your, your patchy, touchy instead. Next, we are going to discuss about partial anterior circulation infarct and total anterior circulation infarct. Both these infarcts are actually the more sinister forms of cerebral infarcts as opposed to lacuna infarct because they involve the larger cerebral arteries. So what separate Pachi from Tachi is that partial anterior circulation in fact involves either the anterior cerebral artery or the middle cerebral artery. On the other hand, total anterior circulation in fact implies that both the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery are involved. Before we move on to the discussions about the Pachi and Tachi clinical manifestations, it is important for you to understand this terminology, which is cortical signs, also known as higher cerebral dysfunctions, because uh, these signs are actually the hallmark features of a large infarct, and more commonly we are referring to patients who have patchy or touchy. So basically what it means is that the infarct is large enough and it has extended until the cerebral cortices as highlighted by the arrowhead here. So what are the common cortical dysfunctions that we will see in our patients with a large infarct? So the first one will be aphasia, visual spatial disorientations, neglect, and sometimes they may have alexia, agraphia, acalculia, and so on and so forth. 
The CT image here illustrates to you the areas that will be involved in the patients with partial anterior circulation infarct and there are four possible clinical manifestations for a subject that present with Pachi. So the first one would be motor sensory deficit with hemianopia. So because of this, it's important for you to examine the patient's visual field in the subject who came with a stroke. So the second possible manifestation would be again motor sensory deficit with new higher cerebral dysfunctions as I have explained to you earlier on. And the third presentation could be new higher cerebral dysfunctions with hemianopia. And lastly, a subset of them may just present with new higher cerebral dysfunctions alone. Total anterior circulations in fact are actually one of the most severe forms of infarct because both the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral arteries are involved. Because of this, uh, the patients with uh, total anterior circulation infarct, they would have all the clinical signs that I have mentioned to you in the patients with partial anterior circulation infarct. The last form of stroke would be the posterior circulation infarct, also known as POCHI, which involves the posterior cerebral artery and also the vertebral basilar circulations. Posterior circulation infarcts can have a very diverse clinical manifestations because it can involve any one of these three structures or in combinations. So these structures in, which are important to remember is your brainstem, your cerebellum, and your occipital lobes. So if the brainstem is involved, the patients will manifest as ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy with contralateral motor with or without sensory deficits. So this is what we call as a cross signs, which is pattern mnemonic for a brainstem involvement. So secondly, they can manifest as bilateral motor or sensory deficits. A uh, good scenario would be a patient with an acute brainstem infarct that uh, went on to develop a lock-in syndrome. So lastly, or also rarely, the patients might present with disorder of the conjugate eye movement. So uh, after that, let's take a look at this uh, cerebellar involvement. So I think uh, apparently they will have cerebellar dysfunctions. And the last one to mention about is the occipital loop involvement. So patients with this uh, involvement, they may manifest with uh, visual field defects like just uh, you know, hemianopia, or sometimes they may develop cortical blindness as a result. The first step in the management of acute ischemic stroke is the same like any other medical disorders, which we should start off by taking a complete history and performing an appropriate physical examinations. In these lectures, I would like to spend more time discussing about the clinical management aspects of acute ischemic stroke. Therefore, I hope you can look it up these information in your medical textbook. So I would like to introduce you this modified ranking scale. In short, we call this as an MRS scale because very commonly, clinicians will be referring to this skill when we are trying to establish the patient's pre-morbid functional status. So in simple terms, this skill actually ranks from 0 to 6. So the higher the skill, the higher the disability the patients have. The next skill that I would like you to remember is the NIHSS skill. This is actually a composite scoring system that derived from the physical examination findings. As illustrated on the left hand image, I have taken uh, part of the NIHSS skills just to illustrate to you how does it look like. But don't worry, I know it's a very busy skill. You can actually refer to your medical calculators when you're trying to calculate the scores. So this skill has many important clinical implications but I think the most important one is, is used for prognostications and the second important uh, usage of this is that it will determine the eligibility of a patient for reperfusion therapy which I will discuss with you in depth in the subsequent slides. In order for you to understand the role of neural imaging in patient acute ischemic stroke, it is important for you to understand the strength and the weaknesses of a CT brain as well as the MRI brain. So let's take a look at the CT brain plane first. So it is the most useful tool in the emergency setting because it can be done fast and is readily available in most of the hospitals. And in fact, the role of the CT brain in patient acute ischemic stroke is mainly to exclude hemorrhagic stroke first. After that, only then you will try to look for the uh, acute ischemic changes. Keep in mind that CT brain is not so sensitive in picking up early stroke because uh, sometimes these changes may not be obvious within the first 24 hours. So this brings us to the, uh, the strengths of the MRI brain. 
So it's more sensitive than a CT brain in picking up early stroke. And in patients that we are considering for thrombolysis by the onset of stroke are uncertain, we may tend to deploy this MRI brain in deciding whether the patients uh, would benefit from this thrombolytic treatment or not. But the unfortunate part about the MRI brain is that it's actually more costly as opposed to the CT brain and also it's not readily available in the emergency setting. Notwithstanding that, MRI brain can pick up cerebellar stroke and brain stem stroke more accurately as opposed to the CT brain. So uh, I hope you should keep these pointers in your mind when you are ordering the neuroimaging for our patients with acute ischemic stroke. This is a very well written article that I think all of you should spend some time to read it up in order for you to understand what are the early radiological signs of acute ischemic stroke and most importantly it will explain to you what aspect score is. Aspect score is actually a scoring system that we will commonly refer to in deciding whether a patient would benefit from a thrombolytic treatment or not. I have attached this article links in my video descriptions and you can take your time to uh, read it up at your own. This slide gives you an overview about the investigations that you would carry out at the patient's presentations and also some of the tests you may consider later on depending on the patient clinical context. So first of all, we will perform the baseline investigations and also metabolic profiles which include the sugar profiles as well as the lipid profiles. Next, we will definitely order an ECG because you would need to exclude the presence of atrial fibrillations which are the main cause of cardioembolic stroke. After that, an echocardiogram would also assist you in excluding the cardioembolic stroke that arise due to an intracardiac thrombus. Other investigations include carotid Doppler if there's a suspicion about carotid artery stenosis and you may consider performing a Holter test as well if you think the stroke is due to a cardioembolic stroke like a uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And last and also the most important point is that all patients that belong to the young stroke category, they must be worked up properly. And uh, other more advanced imaging like MRI brain I have explained to you in my earlier slides uh, for MR angiography or CT angiography, it will be more relevant for subjects who might need to undergo a thrombolysis treatment or thrombectomy treatment during the acute presentations. I would like to introduce you to the modern therapy for patients with acute ischemic stroke, which is about the reperfusion therapy. This treatment has been very well established and in fact, it has been proven to be able to improve or restore the neurological deficits our patient may have at presentations. However, these treatments are not widely available yet, but I do hope that one day this would become the standard of care, looking at the many benefits that the patients uh, could have. Let's understand what a penumbra means before we explain about the reperfusion therapy. So penumbra basically it means it's an area that is surrounding the infarct core. For example, this is the penumbra and this is the infarct core which are doomed to date and insalvageable. So the aim of this reperfusion therapy like your IV thrombolysis or your intraarterial thrombolysis or endovascular mechanical thrombectomy aim to salvage the ischemic penumbra which have the potential to recover. In this lecture, we'll be focusing on intravenous thrombolysis treatment using recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, for example, like LT place, because this is the commonest mode of reperfusion therapy among all the major stroke ready hospitals. Generally speaking, the therapeutic window for intravenous thrombolysis treatment has been defined as within four and a half hours from stroke onset. In fact, this is the recommendations that most of our stroke ready hospital is still following. But recently, with more clinical experience, the therapeutic window has been extended up to nine hours for patients with a known onset stroke or patients with wake up stroke who have the demonstrable significant per number core mismatch from a CT perfusion scan. As I mentioned earlier, MRI brain plays an important role in deciding patient thrombolysis suitability. This is especially in the case where the patients have an uncertain stroke onset or patient presented to you with a big cup stroke. Then you will look for MRI evidence of DWI flare mismatch. If the evidence is there, then it may suggest that patients might still be able to benefit from this uh, intravenous thrombolysis treatment. This slide echoed to you the mantra that time is neuron. The earlier the reperfusion treatment, the better the outcome. 
So as illustrated in these two uh, tables, so you can see that if the patient were to receive the reperfusion treatments within the first three hours, the number needed to treat is actually eight. What it means is that for every eight patients that were treated with LT plates, one is more likely to be functionally independent. So if the patient were to be thrombolyzed after three hours up to four and a half hours, the number needed to treat will increase drastically from eight to 14. Important point to highlight to you is that intravenous thrombolysis treatment has its associated risk. The fear most risk is of course the intracranial hemorrhage, angioedema, gastrointestinal bleeding or genital urinary tract bleeding. Therefore, all patients that receive intravenous thrombolysis treatment should be monitored in ICU setting or in the HDU setting. So the doses required for LT place is a 0.9 mg per kilogram, but there's a ceiling dose. The maximum dose allowable is 90 mg. And you will have this chart in your stroke kit, which is a very useful dosage calculator. So in this one is actually for this LT place. So you just have to slide the patient body weight into the appropriate box. For example, like this patient is a 75 kilo. So it will calculate nicely to you about the required dose uh, for thrombolysis. So the required dose will be 67.5 mg and then the first 10% which be, would be 6.8 mg should be given as a bolus and the remaining 90% which has been calculated as 60.7 mg should be given over 1 hour. It may seem that the LT place is easy to give but what is tedious is what happened afterwards because this patient need to monitor very closely and to watch out for the potential complications. It is crucial for you to know the stroke etiologies at the end because ultimately you need to take the necessary step to prevent the stroke from recurring again. So broadly speaking, you can divide it into five etiologies. Your large arteries, arteriosclerosis, your cardioembolisms, your small vessels occlusions, stroke of other determined etiology, and lastly, stroke of undetermined etiologies. So at the end, a complete stroke diagnosis will be as demonstrated in the last uh, sentence. For example, lacuna infarct, lachi, due to a small vessel occlusions, then you'll give an MRS score, which is a patient pre-morbid status, and the NIHSS score, which is the patient's current uh, neurological deficit scoring. It is important for you to pay equal attention to stroke complication preventions. The first reason is that most of, of our acute stroke patients will have reduced mobility, hence they are at an increased risk of developing DVT and also pulmonary embolism. So what we can do is that we should provide DVT prophylaxis during acute phase that can be in the forms of pharmacological preventions like providing a prophylactic low molecular weight heparins or the pharmacological form of preventions like applications of TAD stocking. And for the same reasons like I have mentioned just now, they are also at risk of developing bad sore. Hence, we must ensure that our patients have regular turning and also we should apply repo mattress for those patients that have reduced mobility or who are bed bound especially. Also, it is mandatory that all the acute stroke patients should have a swallowing assessment done in order to prevent the occurrence of aspiration pneumonia. If they were to be proven to have swallowing difficulty, then you may consider whether the patient would require a rice tube feedings and at the same time, please collaborate with the dietitians and the speech therapists for further rehabilitations. And lastly, we should also provide the due psychological support for the caregiver and also the patients. Another important aspect of stroke care is secondary prevention, which aims to prevent the patient from developing another episode of stroke in the future. So this can be broadly divided into the pharmacological treatment arm and the lifestyle modifications. So I'll just focus on the pharmacological treatment in this slide, which includes anti therapy, for example, like your cardiprin, aspirin, or plavix. And it is also crucial for you to optimize the patient blood pressure control and the glycemic control and also to introduce lipid lowering therapies. Generally speaking, in patients with cardiovascular risk or patients with uh, stroke, we will start up the patient with a uh, high potent uh, statin. One of the example would be your Atoa statin. Even though the recommended dose is 80 mg on night, but in practice, we will start the patient with 40 mg on night first and then which will be followed by further optimizations in the subsequent review. And the last point is that if the patient is proven to have a cardioembolic stroke, for example, having a concomitant atrial fibrillation, then anticoagulation treatment will be warranted. 
in the secondary stroke prevention. So most importantly, all patients with acute ischemic stroke should receive inpatient physiotherapy or inpatient rehabilitation before discharge. I will end these lectures by uh, informing you that certain stroke phenotypes require special considerations. So the first one would be malignant infarct. And a good example would be your MCA infarct. So why we call this a malignant infarct? Because uh, when you have a large volume of uh, infarcts, it will give rise to a very significant cerebral edema. Ultimately, it will contribute to a raise in intracranial pressures. So in this kind of uh, cerebral infarct site, they should be monitored in HD or ICU and be given the necessary cerebral protections. And most importantly is that if the rate of intracranial pressures has contributed to a drop in the GCS, then we need to refer to our neurosurgical colleague for consideration that they might benefit from an earlier decompressive cranectomy in order to bring down the intracranial pressures. Patients with cerebellar infarcts should be monitored closely because they are at risk of developing acute obstructive hydrocephalus. The reason being is that your cerebellum is actually very adjacent to the fourth ventricles. When there is a significant cerebellar edema, it may compress on these fourth ventricles, therefore giving rise to acute obstructive hydrocephalus. Hence, cerebellar infarct subjects should be monitored closely. If there is a drop in the GCS, please consider the patient might have acute obstructive hydrocephalus as a result. If that's the case, then you need to refer neurosurgical team for considerations of uh, emergency VP shunting. The last slide just to bring your attention that some patients require a repeated CT brain during the emissions. So the first indication apparently would be when the patient have a new neurological deficit when they are under your care. So this is important because you need to rule out hemorrhagic transformations. Also you want to rule out malignant infarct with mass effects like I have mentioned earlier on. And also you want to rule out new stroke. This is especially true for patients with uh, cardiac embolic stroke presentations because they may have the events what we call as uh, embolic showering during the emissions. And secondly, I think this is a bit optional, so it depends on the availability of CT scan and also whether the patient is agreeable to undergo another CT scan or not because keep in mind that CT brain is uh, associated with uh, the risk of ionization as compared to your MRI which doesn't come with the risk of uh, ionization. So if you have a strong suspicion of uh, stroke for uh, patients, but however the CT brain report show normal findings or the CT brain report doesn't correlate with the clinical neurological deficit, then at times you may consider repeating the CT brain after 24 to 48 hours of the stroke onset.